Hello there, sports fans. Dick here. You might recall a while back that pal and partner Dave and I took off on this project that was put on published on YouTube by by Skocom Hobby Electronics English fellow named Jerry. It's a lovely project, very nice project. We were we were really excited about it, so we went ahead and we, we built it. We gathered up the parts. It's based on an Arduino, the little uh, microcomputers, microcontrollers, they call them, that, that you all know I like to really play around with a lot. So this is the result, and they work very nicely. They work very nicely. Got the keyboard to enter a new frequency with, and uh, the display to display the current frequency, battery voltage, because it's battery a battery-run device. And uh, number of satellites we're receiving. There's a little GPS receiver here that that will uh, uh, receive. Hey, go oh, quite a number of satellites. I've seen it re receive 10, 12 satellites at the crack, and it locks its its frequency oscillator into the into the uh, CCM controlled oscillator that's coming from the satellite, which is very, very, very accurate. Now, why would we want something like this? I mean, you, you might imagine, why does anybody need a, such a thing as a frequency standard? Well, this is also a frequency generator, which makes it very nice, because I can, I can generate very accurate frequencies up to around 10 or 12 megahertz even. And I use those a lot to calibrate my test equipment, uh, particularly for us amateur radio uh, operators, K0DG here and Dave. N0 Zulu Whiskey, we have to keep our amateur equipment, even though it's called amateur, it's not really an amateur service, it just means we can't charge for, for our communication services. But uh, we have to stay within very, very strict limits on where we can transmit, and we have to stay within those limits called frequency bands. If we stray outside, we can, uh, we're subject to uh, and liable for all sorts of penalties possibly even jail time, fines, and also the loss of our ham radio licenses, which we worked very hard over the years to obtain, and we're not about to mess around with possibly losing those. So every ham is interested in, in keeping his equipment as accurate as possible, particularly in the frequency spectrum, but uh, we also have equipment that we can calibrate other equipment with in terms of voltage, current, inductance, capacitance, uh, anything that we need to measure to maintain, operate, build, design our electronic equipment. This piece of gear is uh, fantastic in its accuracy for uh, such a <laughs> such a nominal fee in that you can build it yourself. Now I have a Rubidium standard on my desk that new is around $1,200. uses a Rubidium uh, crystal oscillator or Rubidium oscillator called a physics package. It's very accurate. Now, how accurate, you might ask. Still wish we had Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon around. But how accurate, if you were to ask that? Well, the rubidium standard is accurate enough that if you uh, watch that frequency to see when it would gain or lose, possibly gain or lose a second, you'd have to keep an eye on it for 32,000 years. Yes, that's 32,000 years. Now that's pretty accurate for just about anybody, and it's more than accurate enough for for the purposes that I use it to establish a correct frequency in my frequency counters and, and my other equipment. So this little thing, with uh, probably everything involved in here in terms of parts, is probably maybe thirty dollars, if that. Uh, of course, I didn't pay a thousand dollars for my rubidium standard either. I bought it used, and it's over on the bench. I use a distribution box to to use those signals out of it, uh, 10 and 15 megahertz, which is all it'll generate for my use. That's very handy. I've calibrated all my equipment with it uh, over the years. The trouble is, if I want to get a, a 450 hertz signal to test or check or work on something. Uh, 455 kilocycles for an inter intermediate frequency, IF frequency, in a, in a standard broadcast radio receiver. Well, I've uh, got to kind of do some 
go to the divider chain or do some jury rigging around on my own to get anywhere near that frequency. With this little tool, I can just key in the frequency 455 kilohertz and it'll generate that that exact frequency for me based on that rubidium precisium standard, in this case on the satellites that it's synced to. That's phenomenal. I mean, something like this, when I started ham radio 60 years ago, you could only dream about. Well, there are a few disadvantages with this one when you're operating it in that to key in a new frequency, you'd hit the A key, key in the frequency, hit the B key, and while you're doing that, it can't monitor the satellites to tell you how many satellites you're receiving and whether or not you're actually uh, locked onto a satellite so you know how how accurate your frequency is that's being generated. In order to do that, you had to hit uh, this number key and it would fall into a loop and it would monitor the satellite. However, you couldn't uh, do anything else. It was tied up in that loop and that was all it would do. So you'd have to hit that key again to pop out of that loop and then do your key entry or check your battery voltage by hitting the C because it has a uh, internal battery check circuit to check the check the voltage on your battery. If it gets too low, then you're you're going to start having some trouble with with all of this stuff working for correctly. So, okay, that's that's basically uh, what we thought. Well, you know, if we could if we make a multiprocessor system so that instead of one processor is doing all the work, we can split the monitoring and uh, watching the uh, data stream coming out of the GPS with the second one. Let it do the looping kind of business or whatever it needs to do. And when it gets some data that the other processor would be interested in, it can tap him on the shoulder. That's called an interrupt. Say, hey, dude, I got some, some data for you here. And he says, okay, send it over. He'll send it over. He'll process it, then go back to what he was doing. You don't have to be doing any of this, this key and stuff over here. And if the only thing you've got to do besides enter the numbers is is to key, uh, tell it here, here comes a frequency that I'm going to enter. You can use the asterisk key for that, enter your frequency, and then terminate it. Just like you do if you dial somebody on a telephone and they ask for a number, you can hit the pound sign key and boom, it takes off. Everything happens at once to, as far as the operator is concerned. And that would be a really nice feature to have. So Dave and I were talking about it one day while we were playing with these, while we were building them, and we said, let's do that. So by golly, we went to work, and sure enough, that's what we've done. So this series of YouTube posts is going to add on to the work that SCOCOM Hobby Electronics and Jerry, our friend Jerry, did. And we're... Uh, we're going to come up with a new version with a dual processor, master and a slave. And we'll uh, share with you how that works and how the programs work. We'll just have a high old time with this stuff. Okay, without any further ado, here we go. All right, we'll explain some of the mods to the Skullcom Electronics frequency standard frequency generator that we made here to make it, uh, we've turned it into a multi-CPU system. System with a master processor here on the left and a slave processor on the right. We've also converted to a 4x3 keyboard since we don't need all the extra keys anymore. And it runs just fine with with only 12 keys, the idea being that when we key the frequency in, we use the number keys. In order to trigger it to accept the new frequency, we'll use the asterisk key, and when we've entered the new frequency that we want to generate, we'll use the pound sign to terminate the entry. And the reason we can do that, it's uh, the uh, slave processor its only job is actually to listen to the streaming output from the GPS, watching for the GGA record so he can extract the number of satellites from it. And when it does extract the new satellite count, you can see on the readout, which has been converted to I2C now rather than using up all those pins on the Arduino, uh, it will interrupt the master processor to tell it it's got some new data for it. The master will post that fact and when it gets a 
little free time, it'll pop over and tell the slave to send it the new data, which it will. And it will use the new data to calculate uh, how many, whether it's locked or unlocked, how many satellites there are and display it on the, on the LCD. Now, it's always displaying that on the LCD. It doesn't go into a polling loop anymore like the original version does, so that makes it a lot handier. It's really asynchronous to the to the operation of the master, whose main job actually it is, is to monitor the keyboard and, and display data to the LCD, and when it has to, it'll send new frequency data to the slave, which will relay it over a software serial port, like just as the original did, to the GPS module to establish a new frequency. Right now we're running a 5 megahertz uh, frequency, and uh, we haven't put we haven't modified the GPS chip yet to run the output into a Schmidt trigger to to use it as our standard output frequency. So uh, if we want to enter, let's enter a uh, we'll poke the asterisk key to start our entry. You'll notice that it pops up with new value, and we'll put in one hertz. And uh, you can see that we've keyed in one hertz. We'll hit the pound sign to enter it. Well, as soon as we enter it, it transmits it to the slave. The master transmits it to the slave over I I two or I two C I I C I squared C, and then it will use the ser its software serial port to send that new information one hertz to uh, the GPS module. And you can see our LED now is blinking at a one hertz rate, one cycle per second. So all of the software actually has been, the main software has been split into two, two halves in effect, where each CPU has been assigned a particular function, and since they operate asynchronously, you don't have to fall into polling loops to, to uh, and then out again to do special functions or other functions. It all runs concurrently. So that makes it very simple to operate and makes it... Uh, uh, much more convenient actually than the than the original version, but it serves the same pur purpose. Now we'll take a look at the programs, the programming. Note that the use of I2C uh, to communicate with with the uh, slave to master, and also the the same bus, the I2C bus, to communicate with the LCD. Cuts down a lot on the wiring, the number of wires we have. We've also added a sounder, a little piezo sounder here, so we get a little feedback when we hit the keys. If you can hear that, yep. Put our one hertz back in, then our entry key. So we get we. It's, it's nice to have that audible feedback. It also uh, just as a little stunt, it'll play the Nebraska fight song when we started up at the beginning. If you listen close, you can pick that out here. Hit the reset. Not exact, but close enough. There is no place like Nebraska. Alright, we'll take a look at the program. The wiring is simple enough. Notice on the I2C uh, line we've got our, our uh, pull-up resistors. And I've changed the where uh, Jerry had used the uh, nice little circuit, a neat little circuit there. Very ingenious to, to convert the uh, levels between the 3.3 volt signals of the input and output of the of the GPS module to TTL levels for the Arduino. Uh, the 3.3 volt output signal from the from the GPS is plenty to drive the TTL input. The specs are, I believe, like 2.2 volts, so that runs fine. You don't have to do anything to that. On the input side, I just used a simple voltage divider, like I usually do. Is I've only got one line there that I have to be concerned with, since this runs 5 volts runs. The module on cut, I think it regulates it down to 3.3 volts. So whatever. It, the input is 5 volts to this module for the power. And this cuts the uh, TTL level down to about 3 volts, 3.3 volts in the, that neighborhood, these two 
resistors that form a divider. So that handles the, the uh, level conversion very simply. It saves a few parts, some wiring. Actually, I think the parts count is probably down. Perhaps at least the uh, it'll be a simpler circuit board. I haven't made a circuit board because I don't know about Fritzing or KiCat, so I'd have to learn more about that to do that. But here I can put, wire this up easy, fairly easily on a perf board. So that might be what I'll do. But the primary objective was to play around with it, see if I could make it operate with dual CPUs like it is. So, which I'd term a successful project. And, now we're finally getting to the we're finally getting to the programming. And so my dear friends, there you have part one. Stay tuned for the exciting part two, which will be coming your way very shortly.